ABC Listen. Podcasts, radio, news, music and more. Hi, I'm Sam Hawley. I'll be back with you with another episode of ABC News Daily tomorrow morning. But right now, Matt Bevan is here with If You're Listening, the podcast about the most important and curious stories in the world. The head of Niger's presidential guard has been described as mysterious. There's even debate about his name. The tenuous consensus is that it's General Omar Chiani, so let's go with that. General Chiani became head of Niger's presidential guard in 2015. He has defended the president from two separate coup attempts. But something must have soured, because lately rumours have been circulating that the president was planning to fire him. Now, the classic phrase to pull out in circumstances like this is, you can't fire me, I quit. But a few weeks ago, General Chiani went with a slight variation, you can't fire me, I'm firing you. Coup leader General Tiani has suspended the country's constitution and named himself head of state. And as for the president, he's locked himself in his safe room and refuses to come out. Like, seriously, it's been weeks now and the rumour is he's still in there. Soon after the coup, a small group of Nigerians, not Nigerians, Nigerians, gathered in the capital Niamey. They waved flags and chanted, Long live Putin, down with France. The flags they held were Russian. The coup in Niger is just the latest in West Africa. There's been a seemingly unstoppable wave of them lately, washing along the edge of the Sahara, gaining strength each time. Western Central Africa's seventh coup in three years. Seven coups. You see, while everyone else has their eyes on the war in Ukraine, West Africa is threatening to break out into war. On this week's episode, what are France and Russia doing in West Africa? And could they end up in a proxy war? I'm Matt Bevan, and this is If You're Listening. There's a long history of foreign powers landing in African nations and laying claim to land, resources, and even people. They come because there's things in Africa that they want. And the city of Arlit in Niger is no different. It's in the Sahara Desert. It's very isolated, right in the middle of nowhere. It's a sand-blasted place where temperatures are around 40 degrees for half the year and it barely ever rains. Houses are built of sandstone with thick walls to keep out the elements. But Arlit is also very unusual for an isolated city in Niger. Its hospital provides free first world healthcare to all 100,000 residents. There's a modern international airport and a fully paved highway running 900 kilometres to the capital. And that's because French scientists arrived in 1969 extremely interested in the dirt. It turns out if you dig up that dirt, filter it, smush it up, then spin it very fast, it'll start to get very, very, very hot. Hot enough to generate enough nuclear energy to power... Most of France. Two thirds of Niger's uranium is sent to the nuclear power plants that supply most of the energy for France and also its nuclear arsenal. This is why France is in Niger, for its resources, its beautiful glowy dirt. Video from the early days of Arlitz uranium mines looks like footage of the 19th century gold rush. People in shorts sifting dirt by hand. Journalist Danny Fortson observed that in the West, you need a bookshelf full of permissions and certificates. In Niger, you give someone a spade and $2 a day and you're mining uranium. I should say, Arlit is one of a lot of places we're going to talk about today that you probably haven't heard of before. If you want to see these places, check our series out on YouTube and iView. Just search for If You're Listening. This episode will be there on Saturday. The French built enormous mines and made enormous profits. And for the most part, Nigerians put up with it because of the healthcare, the hospitals and the infrastructure. 
In the early days, Arlit was a bit of a paradise, but in recent years, the French miners kind of just lock themselves up in a gated community and ship almost all of the profits offshore. A lot of the big companies have always had that approach that it's Africa, we're, you know, this is a continent that we can exploit. The French are, of course, not just in Arlit. They're not just in Niger. They're all over West Africa. One reason is to mine resources, but there is another reason too. See, while Arlit is a city you've probably never heard of before today, let me tell you about a city you've definitely heard of. Timbuktu. Having combed through lots of archives for stuff about Timbuktu, my understanding is that when you talk about it, you have to put on a very mysterious voice. And so suffused it was with the aroma of wonder that even to imagine it taxed the senses. Or you have to clarify that it's a real place. A place at the end of the earth. But Timbuktu is a very real city facing some very real problems. If the Sahara is an ocean and Arlet is an island, Timbuktu is like a port city. It's in the area known as the Sahel, which literally means shoreline. It's the southern shoreline of the Sahara. Timbuktu is one and a half thousand years old. It was for centuries the center of scholarship in West Africa, despite it being even hotter than Arlet, 40 degrees all year round. In 2011, it was a vibrant desert community, but then Islamic extremists arrived. I saw soldiers and other people fighting. Because I was afraid, I did not ask who they were. I saw people running, so I ran also. They were running from militants from the Tuareg ethnic group. They're famous Sahara desert nomads. Volkswagen has a crossover five-door SUV named after them. Timbuktu is in their traditional land. So is Arlet. And yet when Africa was carved up by colonialists, they ended up without a homeland of their own. For decades, they've fought rebellions to claim one. In 2012, with the help of terrorist group Al-Qaeda, they laid claim to half of Mali, named it the independent nation of Azawad, and imposed strict Sharia law on its new capital, Timbuktu. The Islamists not only banned entertainment like football, television and music, they erased every depiction of human faces, declaring portraits to be un-Islamic. For 10 months they occupied the city, flogging people for things that were legal before they arrived. Women who had never covered their heads were punished if they didn't wear a hijab. For some reason, even this camel's face was deemed indecent. The Mali government and military were unable to stop them. So they called in the French. French fighter jets flew into their former colony of Mali and made swift work of the nation of Azawad. The French president was given a hero's welcome in Timbuktu as women and girls took off their hijabs in front of the world's media. But it's never that simple. Winning is the easy bit. The subsequent Islamist insurgency caused a wave of refugees. Hundreds of thousands of people have fled Mali into camps like this one in neighbouring Niger. Conflict creates involuntary refugees. Then the refugees involuntarily create conflict and the cycle continues. And the French don't want those refugees showing up in France. So they stayed in Mali and settled in for a long war. They called in support from their NATO allies. And that's the other reason the West is in West Africa. Other than uranium, they're fighting terrorists. In some ways, their presence helped. At the government level, West African countries built stronger relationships with each other and democracy and cooperation across the region significantly improved. But for the people, everything just got worse. Across the Sahel, extremism has increased. Millions of people have been displaced and the Sahel is now the epicentre of global terrorism. Those refugees France didn't want came anyway. West African countries were unhappy with their governments who were unable to control the terrorists and unhappy with the French who were unable to help. 
And that's how a wave of coups began to wash across the Sahel. The first country to be hit was Mali. The military in Mali has announced that both the president and the prime minister have been removed from their positions. In 2020, Mali's new military government took power, but they decided they needed some help running the place. The French wouldn't do it. They were being party poopers and demanding the democratically elected government be reinstated. So they called somebody else. On the last market day before Ramadan in the Malian town of Mura, people heard the sound of helicopters coming closer. Four choppers landed and dozens of soldiers got out. Malian soldiers and unidentified armed white men confused the villagers. The white soldiers weren't speaking French or English. The identity of the white men was not clear. What followed in the town of Mura was horrifying. A three-hour battle broke out between soldiers and the jihadists occupying the village. Once the soldiers had taken control of the village, they turned their attention to the villagers. They took 15 to 20 people. They lined them up about 100 metres from us. They made them kneel down and they shot them. Over the following four days, the soldiers tortured and killed hundreds of men. They raped dozens of women, they burned every motorcycle in town, and then they left. I thank God I got out of it. A lot of my friends were killed there. Days later, the Malian government boasted about it, saying it was a necessary anti-terror operation. Others call it a massacre. But still, there was no mention of the white men speaking a mysterious language. But we know who they were. When Mali's military government needed help getting insurgents under control, they called Russia. And when Russian President Vladimir Putin needs a job done, but doesn't want to get his hands dirty, he sends in his private army, the Wagner Group. The head of US military operations in Africa outlined what he understood the deal to be. I've got reason to believe that the uh, Malian government tab for uh, Wagner services is $10 million a month. For context, that's about 4% of Mali's entire government budget. I don't know where the Malian government comes up with $10 million a month. The general said that Mali would need to pay with things other than cash. Gold and uh, other minerals, gemstones, those kinds of things. See, Mali's dirt is special too. It doesn't glow like Niger's, it glitters. Mali, for centuries, has been one of Africa's top sources of gold. Mali is now the second biggest producer of gold in Africa, and Wagner gets a big cut. Once Russia's Wagner Group had helped out Mali, the generals in other countries across the Sahel thought this all looked like a pretty good deal. The wave washed out of Mali and into the rest of the Sahel. The epicentre is Mali, in Mali and the neighbouring regions. In five months, there were successful coups in Guinea, Sudan and Burkina Faso. All of those governments now have deals with Wagner or the support of the Russian government. A few weeks ago, there was just one final Sahel country to have a democratic government and a close relationship with France and the US. It was Niger. But then, like the others, Niger faced a coup attempt. The president's bodyguard took power and the president locked himself in a safe room. And some people in Niger are hoping this will be the end of the West's involvement in the country. The roar of coup supporters fills the air at this stadium in Niger's capital. It was all done without the help of Wagner or Russia, but that didn't matter. Supporters waved the Russian flag and attacked the French embassy. Everyone is ready to sacrifice themselves. These imperialists want our demise. With Western backing, 11 surrounding countries who still have close ties to France and the US have threatened to invade Niger if the president isn't reinstated. Mali and Burkina Faso, who overthrew their governments and aligned themselves with Russia, say if that happens, they'll join the fight to defend 
the coup leaders. The Nigerian president has not been reinstated. In fact, did I mention he's possibly still in his safe room? Niger is waiting to see whether West African nations will follow through on warnings of military intervention. If the coup leaders in Niger are able to hold on to power, it will complete an extraordinary transition in global politics. In less than three years, Western influence in this key part of the world will have collapsed. If the Wagner Group can secure Niger as a client, Russia will have a powerful position in West Africa and access to its enormous resources. France, the US and their allies in the region are desperate to prevent this. A war in West Africa between US and Russian allies is the last thing anyone wants. The region is holding its breath. If You're Listening is written by me, Matt Bevan. Series producer is Yasmin Parry. Check out our video series on YouTube and iView. We will be back next Thursday. See you then. <laughs>